Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, a professionally certified wildlife biologist and natural resource professional, college professor, and owner of Land Source Consulting. The Hunt Science Podcast is dedicated to bring you the latest information on popular habitat management topics, wildlife science, hunting strategies, and the general conservation and land management practices to help preserve our natural resources. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to have you with us and hope that you enjoy today's episode. With that said, let's get started. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our primary sponsor, Landsource Consulting. Landsource Consulting is an Ohio-based wildlife and land management consulting company that I own and operate not only here in Ohio, but through the Midwest and beyond. At LandSource, we work with private landowners just like you to build and develop those property-specific management programs to help bring the goals that you have on your property to life. If you're interested in getting more information on who we are and how we can help you, please visit us over at LandSourceConsulting.com. There you can check out the different service packages and capabilities that we can provide. We would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us and schedule that free consultation either through our website or you can reach out to us and connect with us on our other social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. That's LandSourceConsulting.com, building relationships for a more sustainable future. And welcome everybody to another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, and today I'm joined by Dr. Galsby. Dr. Galsby, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How about you, Eric? Good, good. So, uh, like we were talking off air, uh, I want to thank you for coming on. Like I do all my guests, it's it's a big deal, and I, I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their day uh, and coming on. And and I heard you talk back at the NDA conference in New Orleans, and <laughs> I didn't realize how long ago that was after after you said that. I was like, that has been a hot minute. I, yeah, um, I think it was seventeen. It was, yeah, because I, I remember I was thinking about it as we were, we were talking. I was like, yeah, that's been every bit of five years ago. Well, that was um, a completely different world back then, huh? <laughs> it absolutely was. It's, yeah, it's crazy to think about that, but th- that was a really good conference. And, you know, one of the reason, main reasons I wanted to have you come on because not only, you know, are you a full time professor and focus on wildlife research and things, especially white tailed deer, but you also have done a lot of work with coyotes and, and predator control. And I think this is a really hot topic. And I think it has been for some time. I probably don't have to tell you that, but I think there's a lot of, you know, misconceptions out there. I mean, in our business, in our world, you know, as you know, there's a lot of misconceptions in the hunting world. If you're talking Mm -hmm. about moon phase and there's just things that people latch onto that they don't want to let go, no matter what the research shows. And and I think coyotes and predator management is one of those and, and, you know, how we approach that. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's start off and just kind of give an introduction like I do with everybody. Who are you? You know, where did you grow up? What led you down the path of of working in wildlife and, and being a professor? Yeah, so uh, I appreciate that. I'm I'm now an associate professor at Auburn University, uh, College of Forestry, Wildlife, and Environment. Um, as you mentioned, Eric, you know, a good deal of my research in the past focused on uh, white-tailed deer, my PhD dissertation, and kind of probably why I got started down the road of talking about predator control so much focused on the effectiveness at coyote removal in Georgia at improving uh, fawn recruitment. So backing up from there, um, I guess you could say, you know, I'm a son of the South. I, I grew up in Alabama and Georgia, um, spent most of the, most of that time in Georgia until I moved back to Alabama in t- 2015 uh, to take this job at Auburn University, but um, completed my graduate work at the University of Georgia, both master's and PhD there. And I already mentioned what I, what I studied for my PhD project. Um, but what led me down that path is my passion for hunting. You know, I started out uh, working on a bachelor's degree in general biology with um, it was specifically uh, the pre-vet, pre-vet path. thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, worked at a veterinarian's oh, yeah. office all through high school um, and most of undergrad, actually. Um, but I guess it was probably around my sophomore or junior year of undergrad that um, I got an opportunity that allowed me to go from just being a hunter to starting to give back to the resource a little bit more. Um, actually, one of the veterinarians that I worked with had a good bit of property and he allowed me to start tinkering a little bit with that. And, um, this was, you know, kind of back in the era when there wasn't nearly as much information out there available on how to do that type of stuff. So I gleaned what I could bits and pieces here and there. Um, and you know, especially in, I was being so deer focused, I was reading a lot of quality whitetails, which was put out, you know, by QDMA at the time, 
which is now, of course, NDA. And I kept seeing a certain name pop up over and over. Um, and that was Dr. Carl Miller. And he was based out of the University of Georgia. And he wrote a lot of those articles that I read early on. And man, I just took a chance and, uh, and reached out to him, started a conversation and said, hey, this is who I am. I'm finishing up this biology degree. Here's my timeline. I'd love to do anything deer related with you for a master's degree and, and try to start going down that path to becoming a wildlife biologist. Yeah, that's funny you mentioned that. That so I worked in veterinary medicine for about 10 years. I was pre-vet general biology degree. Um yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to be a wildlife veterinarian. That's what I wanted to yeah. do. I wanted to go out. You know, I spent 10 years in small mixed animal practice and large animal practice and I'm like Dude, this isn't, I, I want to go work out for a state park service or something like that. And I was the yeah. same way as you is I just got fascinated with wildlife management and, and working with wildlife. So that, that's pretty cool. Cause I, well, I, I think really it's, I think that's a, that's, you know, a pretty common story. It's like, you know, both of us probably knew that we wanted to do something animal related, Yeah, but I think so many of us don't even recognize that, you know, being a wildlife biologist is a, as a valid career path. Yeah. Um, it's not something that you hear about as often as you do, you know, like becoming a veterinarian or, yeah. you know, any host of other careers. So it, there's just not quite as much information on it out there. Some of that's changing now though. Yeah, there's not. And, and unfortunately too, you know, I, I don't know how much you deal with it with your students, but like, you know, it, at least where I am in Ohio and the Midwest, there's just not a whole lot of opportunities, you know, for wildlife specific you know, unless you want to go start off as a technician or something like that and work your way up, which is, which is perfectly fine, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it, it can be a little bit of a difficult track to get into. Um, but yeah, that's okay. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You know, with the, I haven't, you know, heard too many people start off like I did, you know, in vet and then, you know, transition out because I had the same revelation. I loved working with animals and I was like, you know what, like, yeah, I, I liked the animals. I liked medicine. I liked anatomy, physiology, and it, th those yeah. paths kind of converged. But then I was like, I want to go out in the woods. I'm a woods guy. I can't yeah. work in an office. Yeah, I like the population aspect of it way yeah. more than the individualistic aspect of it, you know? Yeah, and I was talking with Matt Ross about this on our episode. And, and you know, one of the things about being a wildlife biologist, and, and especially, you know, guys like you and I that started off at more, you know, the hardcore biologies, right? The eukaryotic mm -hmm. cell biology, the microbiology, the right. parasitology, and all those ologies that you had to take. I was like, in just wildlife biology in general, it's like you have the population aspect. You have the large-scale ecological aspects that you have to focus on, but you also have to understand the individual, you know, biology of mm -hmm. that animal that you're targeting on too. So it's like the amount of information that we have to cram into our head, you know, is massive. And when you can't recall something, people are like, oh, I thought you were a biologist. Like, yeah. You know how much yeah. is going? It's called it's called notes in Google, man. I got to refresh yeah. my memory a little bit. It's like, sorry, I couldn't remember if that was an annual or a perennial, you know, my fault. Yeah, yeah you, know, you, can't, you can't know everything and you're totally right and i and what i find myself doing the further i get along my career path um you know it's we're knocking on the door of i guess like 15 or so years since i started graduate school um the more that i really appreciate the ecology and, and, and have an understanding of the ecology you know you hear that word all the time but i feel like it's something that you don't gain a deep appreciation for until you've had enough time and researched enough topics, read about it, talked about it, thought about it. And then you start to realize how everything down, you know, from the bacteria in the rumen of a deer all the way up to, you know, climate affects the things that we see out there in the woods and it affects how populations respond. And, and starting to gain an appreciation for that is, I think, what takes you to the kind of the next level of becoming, you know, a conservationist and a manager. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, and the, the really, the really good thing that I see going on now is there's a lot of, you know, just the everyday hunters, outdoorsmen that are taking an approach, you know, to that as well. And people are starting to understand They're so that. much more educated. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, I got a guy coming on, um, with a buddy of mine. We're kind of doing a first episode of the year, uh, tomorrow shooting the shit episode, our deer season's pretty much wrapped up. It's going on mm -hmm. for a little bit longer. Waterfowl season's pretty much over, except for so we're just doing like an end of the season wrapped up. I've already got you know two deer and just gonna shoot the shit. And the one guy is just a, an everyday you know a everyday guy that just got fascinated and, and intrigued by soil science. And now it's like he probably could you know teach a course on it almost. You know talking yeah. about those things. So oh, it's definitely cool. there's definitely a lot more interest and definitely a lot more education. I mean, just look at YouTube. I mean you can get on there and yeah. type in. You know, anything you want. Okay. So 
the topic of the day, predator control and management, whatever you want to label it as. So, you know, let's start off by talking some of the interesting things that you've done as far as research to kind of prime everybody to, you know, your background and the, the kind of things that you've approached and, and researched when it comes to predator management. Yeah, so the the main focus of my predator research has been on, um, you know, that project that I mentioned earlier. And that project took place in central Georgia as part of my dissertation research. And the basic approach was we monitored that deer population using camera surveys for a couple of years on two properties. There are two large wildlife management areas. And uh, mainly what we were interested in is looking at, you know, fawn recruitment rates. And so we had a really high density camera array put out there. And every fall and every every winter, like right after deer season, we were monitoring that population to look at recruitment because there was some uncertainty about what's the best time of year at that point in time to actually monitor recruitment using cameras. So we were interested in looking at fawn recruitment. And at the same time, we were also using a genetic technique. Um, we were actually taking DNA samples from coyote scats because, you know, they have this uh, amazing habit of shitting in the road. Right. Yeah. Um, and they, they leave that conspicuous sign out there available for us. And so we were uh, taking small samples of these scats and then we could develop a genotype for all these individuals. And then we could basically use that as a, a mark recapture type study. So we identified individuals and we saw how many of those individuals we never recaptured again compared to the ratio of how many we did observe, you know, two, three, sometimes even four times. And that helps us get a little bit of idea of that population's size. And so that was kind of our pre-treatment data. And then we hired professional trappers. We contracted professional trappers. I didn't know how to trap at the time. Um, and this, you know, through this process is actually where I got my education and how to become an effective trapper. Um, but I worked alongside those guys for several months every year um, from late winter, early spring, all the way up through the fawning season. We would intensively trap those properties uh, for two years and we continued to monitor fawn recruitment on those sites, as well as the coyote population size on those sites to look at the effectiveness of that, those predator removal actions. And we can get into those results a little bit later if you want to. Um, but kind of where the, my, where my research path took me from there is we got really interested in trying to learn more about the spatial, spatial ecology of coyotes in the southeast, because there really wasn't much known about that. Um, and especially if you go into some of the mid Atlantic states, you know, they've only had small numbers of coyotes up until relatively recently. Some of these places are still, you know, relatively recently established, uh, as far as their populations go. So very little was known about that. Um, so we started looking at, you know, how do their, how does their movement ecology potentially affect, you know, prey populations, including white tailed deer, but then also understanding how their spatial ecology potentially affects our attempts to reduce their population size. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good one. There's a, there's a lot to, we could talk about there. Um, let's talk about real quick. Um, and I, I was thinking about this, you know, as you were mentioning it, cause I remember there, Dr. Miller, um, did a presentation. I think it was at one of the other NDA at QDMA at the time conferences. Mm -hmm. I did, um, and kind of break down with people. Cause I, I don't think a lot of people understand you were talking about the spatial ecology of, of, of coyotes. Yeah. Talk about the different categories of coyotes, like, you know, res resident populations, you know, transient populations, and some of the research that, you know, I'm sure you've seen from Dr. Carl uh, Miller um, about how far they travel, some of these transient, you know, and things like that, just to get people kind of, again, you know, primed to understand when we, when we get a little bit more into the predator control aspect, you know, how far a transient can go yeah. and, and those, those local resident uh, groups. Yeah. So, um, starting out with with the resident side, you know, we see um, in any given population about 50 to 70 percent of the individuals that you may randomly encounter out there on a property are going to be residents. Most of the time, it, it, it's somewhere around 60 percent are, are actual residents. And what we mean by residents is that they have a pretty well-established territory that they don't tend to venture outside of very often. So if you were to uh, put a GPS tag on one of these animals, as we've done many times, and you follow them, you know, on a year round basis, you may have um, a couple instances where they traveled to areas that they didn't regularly use. But for the most part, you're going to see a distribution of, you know, usually several thousand acres of uh, if you drew, you know, just a, just a, a polygon around all their GPS locations, they're going to use usually a few thousand acres. Now, I've seen certain circumstances where 
maybe an individual female uses like five to 600 acres, but that's really unusual. That's one of the, the smallest territories that we'll typically see from a resident individual. And these residents tend to, not always, uh, but they do tend to be a little bit older and they oftentimes do tend to be mated up. They, they tend to be part of a mated pair. And they'll generally, um, as the, the name territory implies, they'll defend that area and they'll maintain that area. You'll have, you know, individual coyotes that roam through it every now and then, but they're not allowing those individuals to spend any extensive period of time there. You know, they, it's like, okay, you know, if you just want to pass through on the periphery, that's fine. It's not worth my while to get in a fight and risk damage injury to myself to try to drive you out of here. But if you start trying to set up shop, you know, we're going to have a problem kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that leaves us, that leaves us with the, uh, the remaining 30% or so of the population. Um, we've found as high as 50% of the population can be transient animals, but it, it generally falls around that 30% mark and they have no semblance of a territory. Um, the closest thing that you'll see to a territory from a transient animal is they may have a multi-county area. I mean, this is, we're talking like, you know, vast area of the landscape that they're using. They may have a multi-county area um, that they tend to reside in. And a lot of times what we'll see the kind of the spatial behavior from these animals is they'll loop through that territory in kind of a cyclical fashion. And kind of what we think that they're trying to do is, is familiarize themselves with the landscape so that when one of those resident pairs that I talked about just a second ago vacates it for whatever reason, you know, death due to gunshot vehicle. And that's, you know, the two main causes that we typically see um, of mortality in coyotes. They can detect that relatively quickly and they can set up shop and establish their own territory. Um, but in the meantime, there's no telling where they're going to be from one day to the next. And I'm sure you've probably heard some of the stories too, um, that there's been a handful of coyotes tagged in various states by various universities and researchers that have made multi-state um, excursions and wound up in a completely different area. So absolutely no telling where they're going to wind up. And, um, I'm sure, you know, you'll want to get into next, you know, the, the efficacy of removal and stuff like that. And that's part of the reason that every individual that you remove, particularly when it comes to coyotes, doesn't necessarily translate into more of a game population because that animal may have only passed through that spot one time in its life, or maybe it passes through it periodically. Um, but it's only there for a day. You know, so gotcha. it's these resident animals that are probably having the greatest impact on prey populations on a given property. So, and, and I don't know, if, you know, where all the research and stuff was done. And, and I haven't spent a whole lot of time in the south uh, part of the United States. But when you talk about the resident populations of a couple thousand acres, do you know, have you done any research or know of any research, you know, looking more in the Midwest to where we are there's a lot of just like everywhere there's a lot of highways i'm thinking where i am personally in ohio northeast mm -hmm. ohio yeah if i'm looking at a resident population of coyotes and, and i've got them radio tagged with telemetry callers i've got a lot of highways interstate highways turnpikes a lot of ag field not a lot of cover types very you know small timber stand areas mm -hmm. you know flat ag field things like that does that influence their their territorial range is it or is it still pretty universal that they're because I see them running across the turnpike. I see them running across mm -hmm. the highway. So, yeah. you know, I guess is it pretty, you know, common that no matter where they are, that territorial distribution is still you're still seeing that, you know, a thousand acres and in, you know, type of distribution for territory or can infrastructure and, and you know, urbanization densities influence that? Yeah, certainly the landscape influences it. And what I would expect is in in area would coyotes reside in areas um, that are more developed I, their home range sizes tend to decrease um, because a lot of times they're relying on those those human provided food resources um, and so they don't need to maintain as large of an area to to feed themselves but you know if you're talking about out in a rural landscape i think that you know those general those general findings as far as space use probably hold pretty true yeah, um, it, but also, part of what you're seeing too is like you know any of those any of those corridors, um, and this is this is an interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up. Any of those corridors that you talk about, like interstates and like high transmission power line right of ways, 
We yeah. absolutely find that those are major corridors for transients to move through. And I've been on a couple properties that have those those uh, high transmission power lines that are just covered in coyotes all the time. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is just because it's a movement corridor. It's a, it's a highway for them. Yeah, I do a lot of work with electrical util- utilities uh, on the environmental permitting side, you know, we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and, and I see SCAD, I see, you know, kills, I see all sorts of stuff, you know, out there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And, and I figured that's what it was. Cause I mean, when you look at these urban coyotes and like the urban coyote project and things that have been researched and, you know, you look at urban coyotes that are in heavy populated, you know, New York or, or whatever, which people or don't Chicago understand they're there. Chicago. One. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you're in a, an abandoned warehouse that has, you know, cover yeah. you're out of the elements. You got rats, you got all sorts of things you can eat. I right. mean, it, you don't have to travel as far. So you, yeah. you'd think that from the ecological and, and biological level, but I just wanted to double check. Cause I mean, you, you do see them and I've never been a part of the telemetry research, so it's always yeah. interesting to kind of hear. Yeah, I mean, stuff. even if you even if you hate coyotes, you have to uh, you have to have some respect for their adaptability. Oh, and and the the diversity of environments they're able to find a way through. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, they're just they're everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I remember in grad school, you know, one of the one of my buddies was doing doing some work, and they were they were looking at um, the human dynamic of. Uh, you know, the relationship of, of coyotes in these heavily urban areas. And I remember he was telling me, he's like, yeah, he's like, I'd go to these like cul-de-sac areas and I'd go to mm-hmm. all the doors and do like little surveys. And you know, what's your, imp- what's your, you know, observations with the coyotes. And there'd be people like, there ain't coyotes here. And it's like, Oh yeah. no, we've got like <laughs> a bunch of them are collared. Like, no, they're here. Yeah. It's laying <laughs> you know, in your backyard of, bedded yeah, up yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Oh no, they're here. You know, type yeah. of thing. So okay. I found, I found them all over the place, right behind houses, behind, uh, you know, ball fields all over the place. Yeah. It, it's just, it, it's, it's profound, <laughs> you know, where they are. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So let's talk about, so you know, those, we talked about the trains and so that's, that's good. Cause I, I don't think a lot of people really understand that, you know, I think maybe back in their mind, they probably do, but it, it bears repeating because I never see it on these hunting forums and things that I, that I, that I follow, um, you know, no one's ever talking about that. And, and yeah. that, I, I just remember, you know, Dr. Miller, and honestly, I didn't have a great understanding of it either until I heard his talk. And, and I, I don't quote me on this because this has been a long time ago and I heard this, but I want to say there was one trans that they, that went like 130 miles or something like that. Yeah. I think or, there's or, been some even further than that. Yeah. It may be even farther. I may be totally like under shooting that, but I remember it was some j- just crazy number that you're like, Oh my right. God. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess, you know, key take home point there is if you're focused on managing coyote predation, just know right out the gate that, you know, three to five out of every 10 of the coyotes that you remove off a given property probably weren't spending time on your property anyway. They were just passing through. Okay. Yeah. That's a good number to kind of go. So, and I know most of your focus on your research has been white tailed deer related. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, with this show, you know, I, I, I've got people on with upland game birds, you know, waterfowl, we talked about a little bit when it, when it comes to places like where I live and and really kind of where everybody lives, I mean, you guys got large waterfowl populations, you know, coming down your way and, you know, we've got a good Turkey population, So I think people look at this a lot of times, not only from the fawn recruitment standpoint, at least in my area for sure, you know, but Polt, you know, you know, Polt and brood success, you know, for turkeys and upland game birds and and things like that. So, you know, understanding how coyotes move, just like you said, with whitetails, that individual, you know, five out of the 10 or whatever may not even be spending that much time there, Mm -hmm. just like it's not going to have much of an impact on your fawn recruitment. It's not going to have a whole lot of impact on your brood success and, and things like that. So there's probably other issues. And that's that's a different podcast talking about nest rating, you know, predators versus, you know, uh, coyotes and things like that. So but just to, for people listening that are, you know, interested in coyote management because, you know, they've got a large farm. They, they like to see turkeys. They like to hunt deer. They like to hopefully they're in an area where they have up on game birds. And, and, you know, they're looking at predator management as an all encompassing solution. Yeah understanding how coyotes use their their geography is is pretty important so understanding yeah. those two um so let's move into the the age-old question and, and you know i i know you hear this a lot um it, it start talking about the compensatory reproduction aspect of it because i think yeah. that's another thing that needs to really be brought up because you know coyotes you know 
exhibit that type of reproductive behavior. So why don't we mm-hmm. kind of let you talk a little bit about that? Because I know I've heard you talk about that. So I'm going to turn that over to you. What yeah. compensatory reproduction is and how that can play into the the issue of predator management if you yeah. don't really understand your population. Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because there are there are really some unifying themes um, related to predators, predation, and trying to control that um, that affect, you know, really what level of return on investment we get through it, you know. And, th- and compensatory reproduction is absolutely one of them. And it's just ba- basically this idea that, you know, you can think about you have a given area. And uh, since we're going more broad now, let's just switch over to raccoons. You know, think of raccoons as a major nest predator. Um, you know, you have 10 raccoons in a set amount of space. Well, they're dividing those resources, you know, let's just for the sake of simplicity, say evenly between 10 individual mouths, right? There's probably some individuals we know in reality are eating more than others and stuff like that. But just for simplicity's sake, this, you know, kind of a thought, thought experiment, stay with me. So if you kill, let's say you kill three of those individuals, leaving seven behind. So now those remaining seven have increased the amount of food resources they have available to them. Um, You know, maybe a couple of the individuals you killed had better shelter. Maybe they had, you know, a cavity in a tree that, you know, kept them really warm and sheltered from the rain and things like that. So essentially what's happened now is that you've created better habitat for the remaining individuals, not necessarily better habitat, but there's, there's more resources. You haven't done anything to habitat. You've just freed up resources to those remaining individuals And so what you might see in certain scenarios, and we've definitely documented this in the literature across a variety of predator species, is that they get some percentage increase in reproductive output. So maybe their average litter size or their average recruitment rate, the number of those those offspring that survive goes up by, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 percent. Um, and so what you're seeing now is reproductive input has increased as you freed up those resources to the remaining individuals. And what that ultimately results in and what we care about, you know, as hunters and managers is that you quickly end up with just as many predators on the landscape as you had before. Now, that process, I think this is important um, to put into context, too, since we did talk some about coyotes, takes a generation time for most species. But because of the dynamics with coyotes, where you have all these transient individuals constantly sampling and roaming roaming around the landscape, it may not even take that long for that void to be filled back in. You may not have a generation cycle um, be required to repopulate that area because instead you've got those individuals moving in. They're already out there. They're adults um, and they're capable of defending and maintaining a territory once it becomes available. So, um, you know, that's that's why, you know one of the reasons why predator control um, is not quite as effective as sometimes we would hope for it to be. Um, But even in the best case scenario, it also provides the justification for why if you're going to do it and do it right, it has to be done regularly and it has to be done very intensively um, because otherwise you just end up back at your baseline population relatively quickly. Yeah. When I hear stuff like that, I, I always, I always turn back to, you know, Dr. Miller, where he's like, you know, just as he, as he talks, you know, habitat management is not a single event. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. Like predator management needs to be incorporated into that. And it needs to be a part of your way of life. If that's really what you want to do, because like you said, I mean, and, and I'm sure you've seen it. I know I've seen it and I know a lot of people listening have probably done it. It's like, you know, well, I told you, you know, buddy of mine sent me a photo of a coyote killed. I'm like, okay. He's probably, you know, and I don't know, people listen, maybe they shot a coyote and haven't done it in five years on that property, Mm -hmm. right? It's just not something they actively do. They're in their deer stand, coyote walks by, the rest is history, (laughs) right, from there. So it's it's one of those to where, like you said, you know, with with the mated pairs and, and the roll calling and everything like that, you know, you hear these these horror stories of the the exponential increase of of offspring production for that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when you were talking about a generation time for these impacts, what's a gestation? How, how many times do they breed a year? Coyotes, coyotes, just once, yeah, just once. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what yeah. I thought. But for some and reason, in my head, I thought it was maybe two. But uh, yeah, they usually okay. they usually breed. It kind of depends on where you are, but they usually breed late winter, and then yeah. you know have their they have a just same gestation periods as dogs about 60 days. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's what I was just wondering. I was like thinking about it. I'm like, yeah. So 
<clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things I, I always worry about because I see a lot of people post some photos and, and they talk about predator management. It's like, you're not really managing predators on your property. You're right. just taking an opportunity and you might be doing more, more damage than, than it's actually worth. So let's move in to kind of talk about from what you have seen with your research in terms of fawn recruitment. Okay. We're going to mm-hmm. stick to white tailed deer. Yeah. So in terms of fawn recruitment, what is a good way to start thinking about and setting up a predator management program on your property? So you're a yeah. farmer, you know, you've already, you know, leased it out. You've already got the deer aspect taken care of crop damage, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. The other part of it is I want to manage the, the predator population on my property. And for just sake of argument, people, we're going to talk about coyotes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So from setting up that management idea, you know, as we wrap up our deer season here pretty quick, we're going to be pretty quickly into the springtime and then looking into next year's hunting season. How do we start setting up and thinking about doing predator management on our property as an everyday guy, you know, focusing on deer hunting and and others? Yeah. If you will, I'd like to back up a little bit. Is that okay? This this is yours, man. Okay. All right. Great. You do whatever you want. So, so one thing that I do want to make clear is, um, you know, I feel like, and you've referenced some of the social media conversations a few times uh, today, and and you know, a lot of those guys are saying, you know, I don't know why biologists, you know, they just they just must be bunny huggers because they always recommend against predator control, and there's a really good reason for that, and it boils down kind of to two things. One is the ROI, the return yeah. on investment, and we've got a good bit of research, not just with coyotes, but with a variety of predators that show that it, just to put it simply, it's, it's very expensive to do it right. And in most cases you get marginal beneficial impacts. And so if that's our job as biologists is to inform the end user, the stakeholder of what they can realistically expect based on the science from implementing some management action, then it's our job to convey that to them. And sometimes, you know, as biologists, we, we give that recommendation so often that we don't provide that entire explanation behind it. You know, they just, they're just left with saying, well, he doesn't want me to control predators for some reason. I guess he just doesn't like predator control, but that's one of the reasons. The other major reason, and this one may be even more important to me personally, is that I feel like it's a, uh, it's kind of oftentimes a step, you know, 10 on an objective list of managing a property with habitat always for me, habitat's going to be number yeah. one. Um, and the unfortunate thing is a lot of guys want to skip steps one through nine and go straight to 10, (laughs) right? Listen, I get it, man. Like you watch those YouTube videos of guys with, with tripods out there with the Fox pro, you know, suppressors out there. Like that's gotta be fun as shit out there. Yeah. Coyote management. Like who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. So yeah, I'm with you. I get it. There's nothing wrong with it. And back in the day, I haven't done it in a while, but back in the day I shot several coyotes from the deer stand. You know, yeah. and I have no problem with it. If it makes you happy um, and it's legal and ethical, by all means, you know, I drew my bow back on one a couple of years ago because it was had a nice black pelt. But yeah, um, and I wanted that, her. but yeah. I wanted that, but he never stopped for me. But anyway, um, so, you know, we, we just want we de-emphasize predator control because I think that there's a lot of other fundamental aspects to managing a property that folks like to skip over before they get to that. Now. In the scenario that you have addressed those other things, the first thing that I would want an individual to figure out either on, either on their own or through the help of biologists before they implemented a predator control program is to determine that they, they actually need it. Um, And especially in the case of deer, I have been to very few properties that had a reasonable antlerless deer harvest that actually needed to increase numbers by removing predation. And in fact, I've been to a lot of properties where I would actually like to see the deer population reduced, but they're still managing predators. You know, Um, it just, it it seems like there's this fundamental drive in us and maybe it's, maybe it's something that's like our, our, our primitive, our ancestor DNA that we don't like to compete with other animals for food resources. And so we just don't like the idea that something besides us is out there eating these animals that we like to harvest and eat. Right. Yeah. But in, in many cases, I think that um, it, you may find that it's not even really needed that your population is already in balance with the habitat, or maybe it's even too high for the habitat. So that's something that I think is very important for, for folks to establish before they start going down this path of predator control. 
Yeah. And, and as we do this too, and you know, things that I do with, uh, you know, clients of mine and, and friends of mine, and you know, it, it, you brought up a good point because listen, nature has been working just fine mm-hmm. for millions of years. You're right before man. So you hit the nail on the head is the steps one through 10. Like you have to have habitat. If you have good habitat, these animals can avoid predation. Now, of course, Mm -hmm. there are animals that are going to succumb to predation. But if you provide all of the habitat needs of food, water, the cover, the space, and you're doing everything that is beneficial for them, fawns are going to be avoided. They're going to avoid predation by coyotes, right? If they have, you know, these early successional areas with six foot tall vegetation, thick, the wind can't get through there. There's, it's just, of course, you're going to get some that are going to get preyed upon, but just like you, just like you said, like the populations are going to check themselves in most cases, but you've got to have the habitat. If you don't have the habitat and you increase the, the likelihood of predation, you talked about these linear transmission corridors, they're predator islands. If you really yeah. start looking at this stuff, you've got under you got undeveloped, you know, forest canopies with very mm-hmm. poor understories. There's no mm-hmm. cover. You know, yeah. it, it's just they're running, they're cruising through there. Look, there's a rabbit. Look, there's a bird. Look, there's yeah. like it's just it's easy. It's easy pickings. And talking about programs, I know there's probably people listening. You know, and you can add into this too. Is well, how do I know? if my recruitment is good. Well, mm-hmm. there's things out there the NDA puts out, how to run yep. a trail camera survey, how to conduct a trail camera survey, how to look at your buck to doe ratios, how to look, take observations, how many does that I see, how many mm-hmm. fawns that I see with that doe in the following year. Then guess what? And this is things that I try to get my friends to do, but it's like pulling teeth, you know, is is go out Amazon or whatever, order a, a live, a, a, a tape, uh, excuse me, a weight tape, you know, Take some mm-hmm. biological data of your harvest. Yeah. Everyone's just so easy to take the knife and gut the thing. Yeah. Get a lot, get a rough live weight. Okay. Start logging those things. Be your own little scientist, your own little land manager, and say, hey, my weights are decreasing every year of my doe harvest, right? Yeah. Understand tooth wear replacement aging. Just how, how old is a deer roughly? Oh, it's a yeah. three-year-old deer. It's a two-year-old deer. Whatever it is, those kind of things go into predator management because you have to understand that before you jump to step 10 like you said yeah to go into predator control or even you know those those are all great suggestions and take it one step further and you know learn learn the most common 20 maybe 30 most preferred deer forage plants in your area and see how common they are on your property or is every single one of them bitten off or can you not even find them on your property because those are indicators that before i start thinking about predators I need to either reduce my population or provide them with, with better quality habitat because they, they have some other resources that are limiting. Yeah. Listen, you're, you're going to start <laughs> invoking an emotional response <laughs> right now. Cause I, as I tell people, they're like, I want to plant clover. I'm like, look around. You, you got 70% clover already on your property. Like right. You built a win. Uh, you built a, a Italian restaurant next to another Italian restaurant. Yeah. Like you need diversity. The, the right. world of nature, you have to have diversity. It yeah. might not be, and, and we, I, was, I was thinking I was talking with Matt about this too. We, we, so the podcast with Matt and I, we started off like talking about forestry and we went down this rabbit hole. Like it was a really good podcast, but we were just yeah. kind of bitching about, you know, stuff. But I'm like, you know, people want to plant these clover plots because listen, you can, they're, 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 they're beneficial for sure. Yeah. You know, but they look sexy, man. You could take a good oh, photo and share it with your friends and blast and on fun. social media. They're and fun guess to what? sit over. You could sell, you could sell a product. People get their, you know, whatever. I, I get it but what's not as attractive is the early successional field of goldenrod and asters yeah. and ragweeds and and iron all these different types of things that just looks like and harper talks about this all the time mm-hmm. you know yeah. and just looking at the nutritional forage capabilities of, of those out there like you said the 20 most common plants that you have out there you know there's a reason you know jewelweed yeah is a big one for me. My, my property that I hunt is riddled with jewel weed on the, on the edge lines of of the area because it's marginal, you know, moist, uh, saturated soils, Mm -hmm. not quite a wetland, but jewel weed can, can tolerate those. Yeah. Always hammered. Yeah. The the fluorescence of those are, those little orange bulbs are always gone on that thing. And when I'm helping people set up stands, jewel weed's a pretty common plan. Like, Hey, you see this? I'm like, deer will hammer that Yeah, you know, type of thing. But anyway, we're diverging. And it, yeah. Like but I, I mean, to, 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 to kind of circle back to what we were talking about earlier, yeah. I think you made some, some excellent points about everything that predators affect and everything that habitat 
effects. And the way that I really try to drive this point home when I'm teaching to my students is I, and if they're listening to this, here's a freebie on an exam, right? I'm telling you an exam <laughs> question right now because I ask every class, I have a question and I list out, you know, all these, these vital rates of populations. And I say, you know, circle the ones that are affected by habitat and circle the ones that are affected by predator control. And in most cases, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our predation is on young, regardless of what species we're talking about, white-tailed deer, turkeys, whatever, um, are on, are on eggs, you know, and yeah, sure. You can increase neonate survival. You can increase survival of young through predator control if you do it the right way, which, you know, we can get into in just a second. Um, but habitat affects everything from female body condition to the number of offspring that she has to her milk quality, her ability to care for them. Even if she's a bird, you know, she's not producing milk, but her ability to care for those poults, it increases hiding cover. Um, you know, it increases alternative prey for predators and just on down the list of all these beneficial impacts versus with predator control, you're just pulling one lever, right? And so, you know, I think that that gets through to some people, um, you know, and I think it's a useful analogy. Yeah, it is. But listen, as biologists, we're never going to get through to everybody. You know, no. there, there's people that just are, I mean, I just saw a post the other day about some, someone was asking like a legitimate question in one of the forums. Hey, what does everybody do for predator control? And one guy's like, kill one and hang it on your fence line. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, right. Like what? I, I just, you know, so yeah. you get people that are generally asked, but you get people that just have these age old, you know, they just don't want to, they just don't want to listen to the biologists either and, and understand like we're only as good as the data that we're able to acquire. I mm -hmm. mean, tech, you see it more than I do. I don't use, you know, telemetry too much. We're going to be, you know, with, with this duck study we're doing, but you know, ra radio telemetry callers and, and GIS applications. I mean, this stuff is, is constantly getting better. Drones are constantly getting mm -hmm. better. I mean, the, the type of observational data that we're going to get, you know, as researchers is, is just only going to get better and help our understanding. It's mm -hmm. like, actively that's what people are doing and to not listen to people like you that are on the forefront of researching predator impacts and to just you know these old wives tales I and mean, i go back to the to the moon face thing i mean you know how many times does it have to be beaten down you know and, and it with with i mean two plus two is four man no matter how bad yeah. you want it to be five yeah you know and and, and maybe maybe in the future something pops up but you, you know where i'm going with that it's yeah. just they're always the first to judge but they don't it's like they listen to us when when it can it's convenient for them. Oh well, old habits die hard too. They, you know, they there's do. there's some of these things that uh, I mean, I, I love my dad to death, but there's still some of these things I can't even convince him of. Yeah, and you know, I'm 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 a wildlife <sighs> professor. I'm his son, and he still he still he thinks about you know he'll, we'll, yeah. we're we're going hunting this weekend, and uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if he'll he'll say something about the moon phase. You know that, yeah. but yeah, and when it, when it's that in, deeply ingrained, and you've been thinking about it your whole life, it's just hard. Yeah, for sure. All right, so I know we're getting a little bit short on time because uh, yeah. I know you got some stuff you want to get going. So let's let's just kind of go here and, and and bring this home. So, what is your advice for the landowner that says, "All right, you know, we're gonna we're gonna start looking at coyote, you know, mm -hmm. uh, predator management, right?" Yeah, they don't have any trapping background, right? So, if, you know, getting a hold of someone who does, right? Yeah. But how should they start approaching? designing a predator management for their for their property given that they're already involved in habitat management yeah. timber stand improvement sure. you know those kind of things so they're they're driving home this idea of land management and now how do they focus and approach this predator management idea yeah so one um you know that's all good and 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 in that scenario you just described i have absolutely no problem with the landowner implementing predator control um but doing that they need to like i talked about earlier they need to understand the roi Okay. Yeah. And we don't have, honestly, we don't have really good numbers on game species responses to trapping. We have some numbers here and there. They're kind of all, all over the board, which makes it really difficult to just say, if you do this, your population is going to increase by Y amount. We just, we really don't have that data, but it does tend to, um, that number does tend to hover somewhere around maybe like a, you can maybe expect like a 20%, maybe a 25% increase. 
in response to that. So let's, let's just use turkeys as an example. Um, if you have all your habitat in place, maybe you add, maybe you add another 15 to 20% on top of that. Okay. So just un- go into it with that understanding. And then the next thing that I would want them to be aware of going into it is that um, most of the data show that in order to, uh, to significantly reduce predation, you have to reduce the populations of the responsible predators by about 80%. Okay. And so that's like the random shooting of one or two coyotes every here and there. That's why you're probably just, you know, pissing in the ocean at that point. Um, So you're, you're you're thinking 75 to 80% just to start out with. And so that tells us a couple of things is that, um, you know, we're going to have to be very intensive with our trapping and it's not just going to be, you know, like a weekend warrior type thing to really have an effect. The other thing that I think people need to go into it with an understanding of, is as we talked about earlier, repopulation of areas with predators happens very quickly. So if you're going to continue to enjoy um, the fruits of your predator control labors, it's probably something that's going to have to be done on an annual um, or maybe, you know, a biannual basis, depending on what predators that you're talking about. So it's not a one-time thing, just like habitat, which you talked about earlier. The third thing that I would want them to understand is that how effective you're able to be is totally dependent on the property size that you have available to trap. Um, You know, so the, the 50, 60, 70 acre landowner is going to have a very minimal effect on all, but those predators that have the smallest home ranges, but even raccoons oftentimes cover several hundred acres, especially a big boar coon, you know, they're covering, you know, four or 500 acres, no problem. Um, So as that property size decreases, the ability that you have to control the predators on it decreases as well. So the implications for that are, you know, if you have, if you are a small landowner, it's best to get other surrounding landowners involved. You know, this is that concept of cooperatives that most people I think at this point have heard about. And it's not, doesn't just pertain to, you know, managing deer, managing turkeys, but also if you're going to manage predators, I think that's a, a good application for it as well. So you've, you, you, you've, you've, uh, Temperature expectations, you know, you kind of have an idea of the predator species that are responsible for, you know, whatever populations that you're trying to increase. And then, of course, the next step is to go out and start trapping. And as far as that goes, um, within, you know, the legal frameworks of the given area that you're operating in, um, oftentimes the best approach is to try to stop, try to start trapping, um, oftentimes, you know, at least a few weeks, if maybe not even, you know, maybe even a month or two before they, that period of vulnerability. Um, So whether that be, you know, like late winter for some species where they're resource limited and they're kind of run down or, or before they're younger birth, that's the more common scenario, like their younger birth in, you know, spring or early summer. So that tells you that I want to start my trapping program in late winter or early spring And I want to try to bring that population down as much as I can so that it's bottoming out right during that hatch or right during that period of vulnerability. But then I want to continue to trap through that period to try to minimize the number of new immigrant predators that are coming in or, you know, other sources that are adding to the population as well. Yeah, that's uh, okay. (laughs) That's a lot taken. Um, So what is, I guess, another question I have too, and maybe I should have asked this in the beginning is there a good way for a landowner? I, I'm just thinking going back to like kind of the, the deer aspect, you know, you look at like the trail camera surveys, mm-hmm. what's a good way to kind of assess the property as far as, you know, predator impacts like, okay, I see coyote tracks. I see some scat here and there. It's not a whole lot. You know, if you bring a trapper out you know, how, what's the best way to kind of say, you know, yeah, I trapped this coyote. I know it's here. Do I need to euthanize it? Can I let it go? This one doesn't have a big impact. So, I mean, is there, and I'm asking a genuine question here. Like if I'm looking at a new property and I want to assess the impact of, are you mainly looking at the numbers of your game populations Mm -hmm. to say, Hey, or is there observational ways to look at in, in whether it's trail camera baiting, whatever it is, to start getting an idea as, of is is my resident coyote population six coyotes or yeah. is it a dozen coyotes? And if it's six or ten, I mean, I, you can you can answer this. I mean, 
that might not be a big deal. I'm focusing on habitat. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to have predators no matter what. This is a manageable number. If I do this over here, I don't think I need to jump into quite the predator management realm yet. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Or is there a lot of, is there a lot of unpacking there? I'm, I'm just thinking from so, my aspect. Yeah. You know. Yeah. There's a lot of unpacking there. Um, but, it, but it is a good question. Um, I'll start out by saying that uh, as wildlife scientists, even we're not good at counting animals. Yeah, um, that's why I'm asking. It's I'm super like, freak. It's super freaking yeah. difficult. And and you know I may have I may have um, a, a trail camera put out for every fifty uh, or even a hundred acres across a multi thousand acre property as part of a research experiment, and yeah. we still have like these huge uncertainties around what the actual population is. You know, we can calculate that uncertainty, that error uh, with confidence limits and things like that. But, man, we're still so uncertain about it. So, you know, where does that leave the landowner? Where does that leave the manager? It, it, it really is kind of a hopeless situation. Um, you know, with, with genetic techniques that we have and in, in, uh, spatial capture, recapture uh, analyses that, that we have with really complicated math and these, these software programs that are specifically designed to address it, we still have a hard time. Um, so where I start with that is, are they having the hunting experience that they want to? Yeah. And if they're not, and they think that that's a numbers limitation thing, okay, then I have to start looking at limiting resources, right? Okay, do I, my food's all in check, all that. We've already covered all that earlier. But what's the next biggest thing that I have control of that affects population size? My harvest, right? And so that's the next thing I ask if I go on a property and they're saying, you know, we've done all these things, um, but we're still having a hard time. And I'm like, well, how many bucks did you shoot last year? Oh, we shot five bucks on 200 acres, yeah. you know, and we yeah. shot and we shot 10 does on the same size property. Yeah. And, and that's an extreme example. But I want people to start also thinking about the impact that they have on population size. Now, if their harvest is really reasonable or in, you know, a couple instances I've seen where landowners have gotten down to no doe harvest and they still aren't seeing the numbers that they'd like to enjoy. That's when I start thinking about predator control, right? Okay. Um, yeah. with, with birds, with upland birds, it's a little bit different. Um, oh, Lord, you know, yeah. you, you know, you're, you're mostly, especially with turkeys, you know, you're only harvesting males. Um, we're not really sure about the impact of that on population dynamics right now. That's a whole, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we could go down. But, um, you know, if you're still, if you're, if you're doing everything you can habitat wise for those upland game birds, still not seeing the numbers you want, you feel like your harvest is reasonable. That's when I, you know, I really, I really have gotten to the point where I almost just use those, um, that experiential data to guide whether or not to, to implement control. But then of course you go, you go into that with your eyes wide open, realizing, okay, you know, we may only be able to add 20%. And if they're okay with that, then that's kind of the point at which I would proceed. Did that answer your yeah. question? No, it does. It does. Because yeah, the way I approach it and the way I've described it to people is, is where you were going with it too, is like, you know, predator control is usually last, you know, what mm -hmm. it, it should be your last, you know, kind of step, like you said, step 10, mm -hmm. you know, and I tell people if, again, what you said, if you're seeing the deer that, you know, you would like to be seeing now, now mature bucks, that's a whole different ball game, but you're seeing deer yes. on your property and you have you to know, temper their expectations too. They're exactly. not going to see a hundred deer a hunt. That's not your habitat no, exactly. can't sustain that. Exactly. And it's it, like you said, your harvest, but also your land use applications. You know, what are you doing on your property? Are you running ATVs all over God's creation? Or yeah. what are you, do you, what are you doing on your property? How are you accessing your property? Do you let your dogs run on your property every so often and make new, sm there's a lot of things that can, that can influence deer movement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking again at the numbers, okay. Uh, um, my harvest numbers from this year versus this year, especially if you got a co-op involved. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you said, getting and, and I always encourage people, hey, get involved with your man, with your neighbors, because here in Ohio, I mean, everything's so agriculturally based that in most of Ohio, especially where I am, yeah. you know, it's like, hey, it makes sense to join up with your with your neighbor that has the neighboring farm and you guys kind of put a program together. OK, what's your harvest numbers been like? You know, what's the what's the biological data, right? Getting a hold of biologists like us, you know, mm -hmm. weights, how are they, whatever. Well, those are good. My habitat seems to be good. I'm doing this. 
then like you said now you start you know trapping these coyotes and start to see what you got it yeah that's always been my approach but i've never really asked or really because i just haven't had to do it go out there and actually like you said you know we're not very good at counting you know yeah. animals i mean deer the same way too i mean everything's off trail camera surveys and most recommendations is one camera per every hundred acres yeah you know, it's it's an educated guess. Now extrapolate out to a statewide level, you know, and, and that's right. where I think, you know, we get we get bashed the most. Yeah. You know, yeah, type of thing. Sure. But but yeah, but you know, like just to to more I guess directly answer your question about what the program would look like. Um, you know, if we start trapping intensively and um when I say trapping intensively, I think I need to define that. You know, if I'm if I'm thinking about controlling nest predators. Um, at a minimum in my mind and, and up front, I don't have data to support yeah. this yeah, because yeah. this is so hard to test, but this is just experiential, right? Um, I'm thinking even on a relatively large property about having a trap for 50 acres, um, as far as trap density. Now, when we go to coyotes, you know, maybe we could get away, especially on a larger property with a trap for 100 acres. Um, if it's a smaller property, I might go with a little bit higher trap density because I can maintain that right yeah that, that's um, a big aspect that people don't think about is the maintenance yeah and so that's my starting point and then um you know i found that on most new properties when you go in and trap you know your highest catch numbers are going to be for those first couple weeks um you may want to build a little bit more time into that for coyotes because they can come through relatively infrequently so sometimes it takes a trap sitting out for a week or more before you catch um, but you know, at least two to three weeks before, uh, that peak period of vulnerability as I referred to it earlier, whether that be the fawn drop or your peak and in nest initiation for turkeys or something along those lines. So, um, I'm going to remove most of those animals for two or three weeks. And then, um, I'm going to, when that, when those nests start to, um, when those nests start to be put out or those fawns start to drop, then I'm going to continue trapping, you know, through that period, uh, when the bulk of that reproductive activity is occurring and then, um, and then, you know, next year I'm going to assess, you know, what my predator numbers look like and probably go at it again. If I want to continue to increase that population. Awesome. All right. Yeah. I know we got to wrap this up. Um, so I think that's a lot of information, you know, for everybody too. And, and like, you know, all my other guests I have on, I hope to have you guys on as recurring guests and, and to touch more into like other topics and more specific topics and things like that. But, you know, as the podcast that is young and, and as I am, you know, getting going and get everybody introduced to the people that, you know, that I've experienced in, you know, my career and listen to talk guys like you and things like that. So, um, to have you guys on. So that's awesome. Um, it's a lot of information for people to unpack, but it, it's something that, like I said, I think this is a topic that I have a lot of interest in that I don't have a lot of experience with as far as the predator management side of things. So, um, as we wrap this up, what's the best way if people have a question for you, what's the best way for people to, to reach you, um, and, and kind of end it there. Yeah. Uh, probably best way is Instagram. I'm pretty active on there and I also share, um, you know, just these general concepts and ideas that have, you know, I've discovered in past research or even other people's research too. And then I also keep people up to date on the current research that we've got ongoing. Um, and my handle there is Dr. Will Goolsby and that's DR underscore Will underscore Goolsby and that's G-U-L-S-B-Y. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, I thank you guys for joining us for another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. And until next time, we'll be seeing you. Thanks, right, guys. I appreciate it, Eric. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I want to thoroughly take this time to thank everybody who has listened or even watched till the end of this episode and, and had the opportunity to uh, hopefully enjoy the show that we put out for you. It's something that we're really trying to do and take notes and uh, you know put good quality content for everybody to enjoy. We want to take this moment also to, if you enjoyed the show, check us out over on our social media platforms. Give us a like, give us a follow, check that bell notification, look for the content that we're putting out. Of course, reach out to us, leave comments. Did you like the show? We would love to hear uh, your reviews of the show and any concerns that you have, any any uh, updates or any type of uh, uh, feedback to make our, our content better. We're always uh, open ears for the people that are consuming our show and our content. We want 
want to hear from you. What is it that you want to see and what is it that you would like us to do? If you want to check us out on any of our social media, first off, you can head over to our website, go to www.huntsciencepodcast.com. You can check us out on Instagram at hunt science underscore podcast, or you can check us out over at our Facebook page at the hunt science podcast. Any of those is, is open. You can, like I said, feel free to comment and, and all of the above that you do with social media. I just want to take this time again to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody for watching and listening to the content that we're putting out. It means the world to me. And I can't wait for you guys to join us on another episode until then, everybody have a great day and we'll see you next time.